let us listen to Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus! the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? they asked. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not now doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. 
He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. I enjoy a good thriller, either on the screen or in book form, especially now that I have an iPad and a Kindle, things that allow me to take dozens of books with me anywhere I go. I've enjoyed books by the author Patricia Cornwell, and I've read about the exploits of a heroine, Dr. Kay Scarpetta, who is a forensic pathologist. Like all heroes and heroines of thrillers, she often walks into danger, and I read about a solo midnight assignation in a cold and lonely place, and I find myself willing Dr. Scarpetta, don't go, don't go, I know she's going to end up in trouble. It's always obvious to the reader or the viewer that dark and lonely places where the hero or heroine is instructed to go alone are fraught with hazard and much better avoided. So when I hear today's gospel story about the servants who are sent to the vineyard but beaten up by the tenants of the vineyard, I wonder what on earth possessed the owner of the vineyard to send a second lot of servants, let alone his own son. Why didn't he go straight to the law? Why didn't he have those tenant farmers thrown into jail immediately? How could he risk the lives of yet more servants when he must have known what would happen? And how, for goodness sake, does he know that he must send his own son? It was perfectly obvious what would happen after goodness knows how many servants have been beaten or stoned or killed, could he possibly have sent his own son? It was ridiculous. Reasonable people would have very quickly realised that disposing of the servants was not a sensible way of retaining their tenancy, of course. And it was simply folly to imagine that murdering the owner's own son would enable those tenants to inherit the vineyard. The only way they could possibly have inherited the vineyard under such circumstances would be if the owner was so remote and uncaring he had no idea what was happening. Perhaps because the owner was in a far country, the tenant farmers really believed he was remote and uninterested in what was going to happen on his property. But a moment's thought would have shown them that any owner who took the trouble to send two lots of servants and then his own son was very deeply interested indeed. It's all an allegory, of course, aimed at the Jews, the religious authorities, deeply hostile to Jesus. So he told this story where the owner of the vineyard is clearly God, who sent first of all the prophets, then his own son to collect the harvest. And through this story, Jesus the son predicts his own death at the hands of the Jewish religious authorities. It's a story which perhaps sounds very unlikely to modern ears, and which at first sight perhaps seems to have nothing whatsoever to do with life today but it's actually a story which has some quite disturbing undertones but it often offers a picture of God who is deeply interested 
and concerned with his people but who doesn't interfere a god who allows his people to beat and to rape to torture and to murder a god who's given authority to his people who has given his people charge of the vineyard and who will therefore not snatch back that authority even in order to prevent war violence and the disease that we have spreading today and all the other evils you can think of for our god is not a god of violence he's not a messiah who storms in with his troops a great show of force to sort out all the evil he allows the weeds to grow up with the corn simply sending his messengers again and again and again to offer countless opportunities to change the way things are our god is a god of grace a god who showers his love on all and sundry a god who opens his arms and welcomes every human being no matter who they are or how they behave a god who longs to give all his people the wonderful and amazing gifts he has waiting for them but who refuses to force anybody into accepting these gifts and so he continues to send his servants to the people to tell the people of his great love and to suggest ways in which they might better experience that love but he simply places the facts before his people making no attempts to persuade them or to cajole them into turning towards him he has given his people free will and no matter how bad they are or how much destruction they cause god refuses to interfere with that free will everybody remains free to choose safe in the knowledge that even if they choose evil god will not rain down fire and brimstone upon them but like the tenant farmers in the vineyard some people assume that because god is not a heavy-fisted tyrant who visits terrifying punishments on his people he either doesn't exist or is so remote he's not worth worrying about they will discover their mistake when god comes to collect his harvest the harvest is in terms of people who believe in god and in jesus the human face of god all that's necessary is belief in the reality of god because those who truly believe can't help but develop a relationship with this god who loves them so much and those who experience that love are actually incapable of keeping it to themselves they can't but allow it to overflow to all those people around them and once a genuine personal relationship begins to develop with this God of love, this God within, then the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace and so on, begin to come to fruition. None of us know when harvest time is for God. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And the length of his days is very different to the length of our days. But he will come for the owner of the vineyard loves his people and he wants the harvest. What is our part in all this, I wonder? Well, we Christians are the tenant farmers and it's our responsibility to farm in such a way that the harvest is plentiful. We are the ones to whom the owner of the vineyard will look when he comes to collect his harvest. So it's up to us to show our world that there is a better way than violence and pornography and the worship of money and success and other evils. It's up to us to show and find a way of telling our world so that the world can actually hear what we say and it's up to us to deepen our own relationship with God so we can't help but display the fruits of his spirit in our own lives and when the owner of the vineyard comes to collect his harvest how good it will be to hear him say well done thou good and faithful servants James asked me to finish with a prayer as you well remember I never do what I'm told I wonder if I can finish sharing this meditation with you it's something i came across recently a prayer of peace and of plenty let's pray if a planted vineyard represents peace because it takes time to cultivate the crop when there are good relations with neighbors may we live by patience tolerance and understanding if a single grape represents plenty because plenty comes through harsh pruning training the branches to grow productively may we be nurtured and guided by god's spirit if a glass of wine represents god's blessing it is a cup of sorrow which will not pass until god's will is done it is a cup of sharing in holy communion one with another it is a cup of light-hearted celebration for christ is the vine and we are the branches amen bless you all